those who have and are serving our country in the uniformed services. Paul 2012, and I am proud to have served the United States Army myself. It is my special honor to introduce today's speaker and veteran, Congressman Ron Paul. Congressman Paul served in the United States Air Force in the 1960s as a flight surgeon, and he has experienced life in a uniform and knows the needs of our men and women in uniform. Military members serve in one of several branches of the Department of Defense. The operative word is defense. Ron Paul has never wavered in his commitment to defending our country and believes national defense is a legitimate function of our federal government. Yesterday was Veterans Day. Veterans, commemor Veterans Day commemorates the service of all members, those who have served and those who are currently serving. America has a duty to its veterans, and Dr. Paul supports meeting that obligation. Ensuring our veterans receive care, benefits, and honors they have earned is a priority for Ron Paul. Ronald Reagan said of Ron Paul, quote, he knows well the needs of our armed forces and he always puts them first. Returning to a foreign policy that puts America's national security first will be another top priority. A strong and effective military is called for in our Constitution. As a member of the military, Ron Paul <coughs> took an oath to protect and uphold the Constitution. As a member of Congress, he's taken a similar oath. He has always upheld that oath, never wavering in its principles. In fact, our Constitution is the guiding document used by Ron Paul in all of his voting during his entire time in Congress. He's never once voted for any legislation not specifically authorized by the Constitution. is the single most important responsibility the Constitution and trust of the federal government. No other candidate stands up for our fighting men and women, whether they're on or off the battlefield like Ron Paul. Active duty military members clearly recognize this, as Ron Paul has more support from them than all of his opponents combined. In fact, his top three contributors by occupation, U.S. Army, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, check out the poster. We need to defend America. Veterans have been called to serve, and many have fought hard and died for our country. And Ron Paul always argued that America's military forces deserve better than to be used for nation building and policing the world. Right. Yeah. Our troops understand that he will never put them in harm's way without a clear mission and the tools they need to succeed. He'll never force them to sacrifice our American sovereignty for foreign governments. He, and he'll concentrate on securing our border rather than the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Yeah. I'm sure most of you agree that American troops and American taxpayers deserve better than to be used for nation building and policing the world. When our troops return home, Ron Paul will make sure our government honors the promises it made to our troops. Congressman Ron Paul is a modern day founding father. Yeah. Yeah. so in a much more efficient manner than what we're doing today. And that means that we have to seriously consider our foreign policy and we need to make a lot of changes in our foreign policy. You know, 
in, in the 1960s, I was still finishing up my medical training. I had finished medical school and two years of, uh, of, of residency up at uh, Henry Ford Hospital in Michigan. And uh, the Cuban crisis came up, and that was in October of 62. And I, that was when I was called uh, to duty, and they, they said if I'd volunteer, I could be uh, a captain, and I could uh, pick my service, and I could uh, be a physician. So that's what I did, and I got into the Air Force, and actually stayed in a little bit longer. I wasn't all that anxious to go, I have to admit that, but uh, I, I made the best of it and actually stayed in the Air National Guard afterwards. But those were tough times in the 1960s. They're altogether different than they are today. It looks like today, to me, from my viewpoint, is we, we're, looking, we're looking for enemies to fight and looking to stir up trouble. But we had a major crisis on our hands in 1962. The Soviets were at their peak. They had 30,000 nuclear missiles. They were putting them in Cuba. And uh, we just didn't know how that would turn out. Fortunately, actually, by the time I got sworn in, the uh, missile crisis was over. But the unfortunate part about it was the other problem we had during the 60s, the Vietnam War, accelerated at that time. So uh, we, we didn't clean up the mess very, very quickly. But I think there should be a lesson that uh, we uh, could carry away from what happened in 1962. Because, uh, because of the crisis that came up, uh, there was actually diplomatic uh, negotiations with the Soviets. You know, today when I suggest that maybe we ought to use a little diplomacy before we go to war on some of these, in some of these areas, uh, people say, oh, no, no, you can't talk. They're really bad guys. Yeah, some of them are very bad guys. Okay, but can you think of anybody worse than the Soviets, the Chinese communists who killed hundreds of millions of people? But we still knew it was best to at least talk to them. So there were negotiations. Our diplomats worked together, and Khrushchev and Kennedy talked, and uh, they decided, well, you know, uh, the best way uh, to keep from a nuclear holocaust coming about, uh, they, they agreed that uh, the Soviets would take their missiles out of Cuba. We took our missiles out of Turkey and Eastern Europe. And uh, the thing got settled rather quickly. At that time, they weren't even allowed to talk about it because they thought that we were capitulating too much. But believe me, I think the world was much better off using a little bit of diplomacy rather than deciding we have to go half cocked off and starting another war. That's what I think we, we have to do. But the tragedy, the tragedy of the 1960s continued in, uh, in, in Vietnam. And I'm sure there are veterans here that uh, dealt with it as I did. I did not go to Vietnam, although I was in between 63 and, and 68, but had to deal indirectly with people getting ready to go over and those that, that, that came back. Um, but that was an acceleration of war. It wasn't declared. We, we didn't have the effort behind it as we did in World War II. There, uh, Japan and Germany attacked us. There was a declaration of war. The Congress endorsed the war. The people endorsed the war. And the war was, the war in Afghanistan is twice as long as uh, the war was, uh, you know, in World War, World war II. And uh, this means that if it's done properly, the founders understood this, that we don't go to war casually. And if you do it, you get permission, proper permission. You know who the enemy is. You make a declaration. You fight it. And you win it. And you come home. Yeah. To, uh, we haven't declared a war. And think of many wars we've been in, Korea, Vietnam, and the many, many little wars, always very damaging war. Now Afghanistan and, and uh, the Middle East, I mean, we, we're actually bombing about six different countries over there. And the real tragedy to me is they don't even get proper permission. It's done just by the president making the announcement. So I pledge, as a president, I would never go to war without the proper authority through the congressional process. <laughs> This pledge is taken in context of what has been known for a long time since the writing of the Constitution. That if our country is attacked, or if there's an imminent attack, and there's no time to do this, you're responsible to defend this country. But that is a lot different 
than what our current president has done in saying, well, we got to go and, uh, and had some uh, justifications for uh, sending our money and our weapons and getting involved in Libya and costing over a billion dollars and we're going to be there for a long time. Yes, we overthrew a dictator, but at the same time we introduced right now the strong possibility that the Al-Qaeda will be very strong in Libya, as in other of these countries uh, that, are, that are revolting. So the way, the way you go to war is, of course, very, very important. And uh, the, one, the one process that uh, I think is, is something we all should reject, and that is get the authority to go to war from an international government body like the UN and NATO. We should never allow that to happen. It should always be our declaration and under our national sovereignty, and we should not recognize that the United Nations can send our young people off the fire. Is it dangerous to get involved carelessly? Dangerous in the sense that I believe it distracts from our national defense. I believe we get make more enemies. I believe we don't end the wars and all the reasons that uh, we are observing right now in these past uh, in, in these past ten years. But there are other reasons to be concerned about a perpetual war atmosphere. During World War II and World War One. Uh, there was an atmosphere where people said, we are at war now. When we're at war, we're supposed to sacrifice our liberties. And civil liberties are violated more under conditions of war. And that's been accepted. But I have a personal belief and conviction that you defend the Constitution. Even in war times, the civil liberties of all Americans should be protected and not ignored. Amen. with an atmosphere like this, especially when the declaration of war is against something vague and it's against an ism, it's against a tactic like terrorism, which means that anybody we suspect around the world are subject uh, to our bombs and, and, and missiles. Uh, this means that the attitude toward our civil liberties is a perpetual threat to us. And uh, of course, after 9-11, within days, there was a bill passed that had been floating around for years, but the conditions were right for it to be passed because everybody was frightened. So they passed the Patriot Act. What we need to do is repeal the Patriot Act. Yeah. I remember they, that day uh, very well because uh, I, most of us do remember the immediate after effects of 9-11. But this bill came to the floor, although it had been floating around, the final version was not available to us. I think the bill came to the floor about noon, and uh, it had been discussed in the Senate, but they changed it at the last minute, and we had the bill, we had about an hour to look at it, and an hour to debate, and, and then there was an up or down vote. You know, I was sitting beside another member, and he was voting for it. And I, I knew he was sympathetic a, a bit to what I had talked about, and I said, why, why, are, you, why are you voting for this? You haven't even read it. And uh, he says, I gotta vote against it. He says, the, uh, under these conditions, after 9/11, it's called the Patriot Act. He says, he says, how am I gonna go home and explain it to my people back at home? I said, well, that's what your job is supposed to be all about. <laughs> Fear, whether they're, they're concocted fears of what might happen to us overseas or economically here at home. There seems to have to have the fear level really bumped up in order for the people to get frightened in order then to get the congressman to capitulate and, and go along with this. And uh, so we, we still have a, a lot of that. Today, uh, uh, right now, there's a lot of debate going on about uh, you, you know, Iran, this is, uh, you know, and it's a bad regime, there's no doubt about it, and uh, we should be very much aware of that. But then again, if you compare how we handle things uh, in October of 1962, and what a lot of people want to do right now, they want to start a war against the Iranians who do not have a nuclear missile, they have no concrete evidence that they're going to have a nuclear bomb, and we're going to go to war, they want to go to war, 
just because they might get a weapon someday, I would say step back and be thoughtful and reconsider this and there may be another way to work our way out of this. You know, one thing that uh, we have conditioned the countries of the world, because we are the superpower of the world, the sole superpower, is so uh, what our government did, uh, and other governments did with, um, with Libya. You know, they did some talking and uh, wheeling and dealing, and uh, some of it was uh, below board, it wasn't all above board, but anyway, they talked to uh, Gaddafi of uh, giving up all his nuclear ambitions. Look what happened to him, you know. So actually, we as a as a country, uh, you know, treat people differently. I'm convinced that there would have been no invasion of Iraq if they thought they really did have a nuclear weapon. But they used this atmosphere of post 9/11 and said, "Oh, Al Qaeda was there, and nuclear missiles." It was all all fabricated, and uh, it was war propaganda. It went on for a couple of years until the sentiment was right, and yes, they went in and they got the media hyped up and the people hyped up, and and look look at the tragedy. Uh, the first uh, attempt to set the stage for the war against Iraq came in 1998. It was called the Iraqi Liberation Act, and it was to change our policy, and our stated policy there was regime change. And they worked on that, and then when 9-11 came, there was a reported meeting in the White House shortly after 9-11 where there was a little bit of excitement. Now we have our chance to go into Iraq. And I had some of that information handed to me uh, firsthand. Uh, so uh, the, the whole thing was to go in and do it and look, look at the tragedy. We even forgot about Ben Laden for, for 10 years. So we, we have to keep focus on, on what national defense is and not projecting ourselves around the world. I mean, it, it is a bizarre foreign policy. Uh, we make the assumption that because we're the superpower, we have to tell everybody what to do. I would say that maybe we ought to set a standard, take care of our own people a lot better, and maybe other people want to live and act like we do. <laughs> but we, we continue to do this, and we go to the countries, and we have propped up many a dictator starting as far back as the, uh, getting our dictator into Iran. We threw out an elected leader, put him to Shaw, and there's a lot of bitterness yet from that, and uh, we, we have to understand that. But we have propped up dictators for a long time, more so since the Soviets aren't uh, around anymore. And uh, these dictators, um, you know, sometimes we're with them and sometimes we change our minds. So I think what we generally have followed, the foreign policy, is going to these uh, these countries and saying, you know, if you do our bidding, we'll protect you, we'll keep you in power, and we'll send you a lot of money. And there's a lot of takers on that. And they, there's a lot that have accepted uh, our protection. A lot of protection has been accepted for a long time like that. But uh, what happens if they don't? They usually get bombed. You know, so uh, I, I would think there should be this third option of, of you know, we have 12, almost 12,000 diplomats. Don't you think we ought to use a little bit more diplomacy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I used to think there were only three, you know, that we only use two options, money or bombs, and I want to suggest the third option because actually that's what our Constitution would dictate, that we don't have a right to do this, and the founders strongly advised us to do this. But I found out there's another option, and this, this is even more disconcerting. And this one is what, the way we treat Pakistan right now. You know, we're in Pakistan, uh, we have our uh, drone missiles around, and uh, we're dropping bombs quite frequently, always, you know, killing some bad guys, but every once in a while we kill some innocent people, like almost every time there'll be collateral damage. But you don't count that, you know, nobody wants to count up the a uh, number of people who grow to hate us because of that. So we do that and we aggravate the people, they're sick and tired of it. And just think about how we would react if we were weaker and another country did this to us. I mean, it would just be so bad. I keep thinking that if we follow a golden rule in foreign policy, it would certainly help us. Don't do it to other countries. There's things that we wouldn't have them do to us.
harm and aggravate the people, the people in Pakistan get more aggravated with their government because their government is still getting money from us and they become our puppets. And here the government is trying to have this balancing act. So here we have a country that we give them money and bombs at the same time. Then we wonder why there's dissension over there and why people are aggravated with us. We would not be less secure if we just came home, I believe we would be a lot more secure. Not only do I think our foreign policy is detrimental to providing a strong national defense, I mentioned under wartime conditions it's, uh, it's always a threat to our civil liberties here at home. But there is another threat because of this en these endless wars. These last 10 years of wars uh, in the Middle East have contributed to approximately $4 trillion toward our national debt. So that is, it is an economic problem. I have said uh, at many times that uh, the argument that I present, which I've been presenting for many, many years, is I'm going to win the argument. Not because of a grand speech and converting all the members of Congress, but I will win and we will win this and sadly, because our country will go broke and we won't be able to afford it, and we're approaching that, and that's a sad part about it. Because the bankruptcy of this country may mean that we'll have to come home, but it will also mean further deterioration of our economy. There is a, there is a false belief, a, a myth, that wars are good for the economy. A lot of people still in our schools, the Keynesians teach, that the Depression was ended with World War II. I remember the tail end of the Depression. I remember World War II, and believe me, it actually got worse. There were less goods and services, less food, no cars, and rationing going on. But they said there was full employment. Yeah, there's full employment under communist Russia, too, communist Soviet. So with full employment, because we have a hired up or drafted 10 million Americans go over and fight, yeah, you get full employment. But the economy isn't, uh, isn't treated well with a, uh, with a war economy. Uh, but uh, the Depression ended when the war ended. Now, the Keynesians said, oh, 10 million military, they're coming back, and what a tragedy, they'll all be unemployed, and they worried about it, and rightfully so. But the Keynesians lost their argument on this, because they wanted, they wanted to uh, have more government, you know, more socialism and welfareism. But fortunately, there was a, a, uh, a reversal on attitude, and the budget was slashed, 60% slashing of the budget. And um, also, also a reduction of taxes by, by 30%, and the troops came home, and the depression finally ended. This gave me the strong suggestion, and one of the reasons why my proposal on what we ought to do is when I had my first year, I'm going to cut the budget with the help of the people in the Congress, $1 trillion in one year. We have too much debt, and that's why we're in trouble. I fear more for our people, not from any foreign government, any foreign attack. We are not going to be attacked. We have more weapons than everybody else put together. We have a strong, uh, uh, a strong military. We have dedicated people. We have dedicated people not only in the military, but the people would defend, defend this country. But I fear for the loss of liberty here and the destruction of our economy if we don't wise up and get determined people in office who say that we got in this mess because we didn't follow the rule of law and what we must do is return to the fundamental premises of the Constitution yeah. and hold the that we can recover from the mess we're in, that we would have to change. We would have to change our foreign policy. We do have to change our monetary policy as well, because the shenanigans that we get involved in, whether it's military or welfareism, it cannot be done without the operation of the Federal Reserve, and we have to look at the Federal Reserve, audit them, and then get rid of them.
markets were private property rights and contract rights. That's the basis of a free society, not bureaucracy and militarism and fighting wars around the world. So since we had this, we're in better shape than so many other countries. We're in better shape than the Russians were when they lost their empire and the Soviet system collapsed. But we, we at least have something to go by. So if we wanted to restore this, we could. It has to take a change in attitude. People have to change, and this is where I am very optimistic. The change in the last four years has been fantastic. The change in the attitude about we're tired of the wars, we're tired of the spending, we're tired of the debt, we're tired of the intrusion of our federal government and our privacy. We want the changes. So the conditions are changing, they're right. The young people of this country are with us on these issues. So there's every reason to be optimistic. And if we did all the things in the correct manner and you had the right people there, yes, it wouldn't go away overnight. That it wouldn't be prolonged for decades like it's going to happen if we continue to do what we're doing. We're already four four years into this mess. It could be a bad year, but that is what is necessary. It's the preservation of liberty. If we get our liberty back, even if we lose a lot of our wealth, we can get back on our feet immediately. Just think, they keep telling us it's a tremendous sacrifice if we to get this mess cleaned up. Well, if you're not on the dole and you're not getting bailed out on Wall Street, it's not a sacrifice for me to get your liberty back so you can work hard and keep what you earn. That's not a sacrifice. <laughs> Freedom has only had a short experiment when you think of all of history, and the best experiment was here, and the results were fantastic. We had the most prosperity, and we had the largest middle class. Now the middle class is shrinking, which is to be expected, and we have wealth gravitating to the very wealthy and the insiders and those who understand the monetary system. And, uh, and, and we, we know exactly how it came about and how it can reverse. So if we want it, we need to make this decision, and it won't be in five or ten years from now. Nobody knows the exact timing on this, but there's no foundation left to the current system that we have. For 40 years now, we have followed this idea that you don't have any, rest any restraint on the monetary authority, any restraint on spending, and now you have this huge deficit and huge, huge debt. This, all this talk up in Washington right now, all this talk about the super committee, they're not even talking about cutting one nickel out of the next year's budget. They're talking about cutting the proposed increases out five or 10 years from now. The only budget that counts is the first year. And that's why we need dramatic and real changes and a lot more confidence in the ideas of freedom and know that we can, we can restore the greatness of America without too much difficulty. Thank you very much for coming. Dr. Paul's going to take pictures with everyone. He's going to do the veterans first. But if you want to get a picture made, we're going to have people line up around here. And we have a photographer who's going to take all the pictures himself. So we're asking folks not to take their own because of time reasons. So if everyone wants to form a line, starting over here, lining up on this wall. Once he gets done with the veterans, you'll be able to flow through and get your picture made. And it'll be up on the Flickr website. Also, another announcement, we have a list of registered voters. We're going to be canvassing a Republican heavy precinct around here uh, shortly after the event. If anybody wants to go out and go door to door with us, uh, we'd appreciate it. It's a beautiful day outside. We've got to get some doors and talk to some voters about Ron Paul. And at 5 o'clock, uh, we're going to be crispy cream down on Church Street. We're going to be having a sign waving before the debate. If anyone's interested in that, we'll have some more information. There's also a debate watch party at Gaddy's Pizza. It's 100 McMillan Street. Uh, Dr. Paul's going to stop by after the debate and say hello to folks there too. Uh, everyone's welcome to come watch the debate with us. So. Anyway, thanks for coming. You should have made the canvassing announcement before the picture announcement. <laughs>